it seems like we're coming full circle. This is where we started. However, this is not the last and final lecture of the course. We still have a ways to go. We still have uh, billions of years before we get to the Big Bang. So um, we're just going to have to pick up the pace if we're going to make it all the way back to 13.8 billion years ago. Um, this lecture uh, is one that uh, challenges, as we've seen previously, it covers some material that is very familiar to the courses, the tradition of teaching the history of architecture. So what is it about this special version of the course that uh, makes a difference when we're looking at uh, the tried and true, the canon, the uh, familiar uh, great monuments of Western civilization? Well, it's a bit harder. It's somewhat easier to teach stuff in Java. No one's ever heard of Java, and it makes it easy to teach because it's fresh territory. What happens when we cover familiar ground? What happens to the topic? Um, so pay attention to the way we teach this. Uh, the goal is to teach the familiar, uh, to defamiliarize it, and to teach it as if uh, we were citizens of the world, as if we were from other places outside of the European dominant Western mindset. Um, so that's the challenge. Let's see how that goes. Um, and in terms of the larger themes of the course, you're going to recognize an awful lot of the general theme in terms of what architecture does, not just what it passively symbolizes, but what it does operatively as an instrument for constructing power. We've seen that before. We're going to see it in new ways. Each time it's a little different. Um, so uh, here's a, an orientation of the planet that we'll see again later in the lecture. Let's see if you um, pick that up. Okay, coming in to our home base. Uh, starting uh, here, we head across, uh, there we are over the Sahara Desert looking at the Mediterranean Sea. And where are we going to go? The Middle East, spiraling in to modern-day Iran, uh, to the ancient city of Persepolis. Now here's another challenge we have. This is what it looks like now. Well, this is a cartoon version of what it looks like now. So uh, what do we do? Uh, we can't look at it. Um, ooh, that's a bad sign. That looks like my slides were reshuffled while I was walking down here, doesn't it? Okay. So that's what it looks like now. What did it look like? Well, we're dependent to a certain extent on uh, artist renderings. Uh, not always National Geographic quality, um, but here's, this one is actually quite well informed uh, and it's a great resource for trying to deal with uh, Darius the first palace in Persepolis on an equal footing with other things we've looked at in the course. And so let's see what happens um, with this. The entrance way, the first thing we're going to look at is this stairway, uh, a very innovative thing that uh, a grand staircase, very shallow, that brings us to the gateway of all nations and then into the primary Apadana throne hall and then on to the rest of the complex. But that's going to be the primary focus. Um, so here we are approaching the staircase in this uh, creative reconstruction. And you'll notice that uh, on the outside, it is uh, very plain and unordained, unornamented, that this is uh, going to be a stark contrast to what we see in the rest. So this we actually have. It's intact. It's a very shallow pitch staircase. Uh, it's intended to uh, create a way of rising up off of the plain of the valley up to this plinth, um, many meters above the valley floor, while maintaining dignity. This is one of the. This introduces. This allows us to talk about one of the main things this uh, architecture achieves. It achieves dignity for those who visit, and it's important because those who are visiting 
are tribunes from other cultures paying tribute to the dominant Persian king of the time, Darius, and his successors. Uh, he establishes the Achaemenid uh, dynasty in 550 BCE uh, and rules uh, for, uh, has a, quite a good run of it until Alexander the Great, another uh, episode of this uh, story, uh, ends it all. And so in this visualization, we remove the walls. This is what it looks like with the walls. Uh, but if we remove the walls, we see uh, what it looks like um, leading up to the gate of all nations and then onward into the primary throne room. This is what it looks like. And so just checking into the plan view, we come up the stairs, pass through the gate of all nations, and into this grand throne hall, which um, is in part inspired by uh, the Persian experience with other cultures. And so the Persians uh, are, they achieve dominance by uh, overcoming the Babylonians and uh, dominating as far from the Nile all the way to uh, the uh, South Asian uh, boundaries of the Silk Road. And so they get exposure, and Darius is, is um, very enthusiastic about learning what he can about these other cultures and being influenced by their architectures, and he brings back uh, craftspeople and architects and builders from these foreign lands that they've conquered. And one of the largest influences here is from Egypt. Now, since we're going backwards, uh, you won't recognize it, so it's our job to register these, this formal vocabulary for when we get to Egypt, because we are going to Egypt. And so here's the view of the current uh, situation. Now, uh, check out what happens here, is all of a sudden you get this rich carving on the face of the staircase, and we're going to go through this uh, rapidly. We go through the uh, gate of all nations, and now we're rising up the staircase, and these friezes, again, we have this narrative frieze element. Um, there's the gate of all nations, the great horned bull gods that... Uh, are simultaneously introducing the Persian gods to these foreign visitors and making them recognizable. So there's a resonance between the Babylonian gods and the Median gods. The Medeans are the ones immediately adjacent to the, the Persians. And it's by conquering the Medeans, and then instead of wiping them out, instead of enslaving them, instead of burning their cities, instead of uh, killing everyone, uh, which is the tradition at this point in human history, they forge an alliance, quote unquote. And so instead of decimating these people, they leave them intact and thus earn the right uh, to rule as a just king because there's enough awareness of what happens in other kingdoms when they get uh, decimated and conquered to all of a sudden flip the situation. So Darius becomes a hero in the lands that he conquers. And so he becomes the archetypal benevolent dictator uh, in this way. And he gains the trust of the people. And that trust is worth a great deal in terms of power, in terms of flows of information. He claims that the, the eyes of the people are the eyes, eyes of the king. The ears of the people are the ears of the king. And he's able to say this because he's created a situation where there are incentives to, uh, to, to spread information uh, about uprisings. So here's a visualization of the Apadana throne hall and the staircase leading up to that Apadana throne hall. Now, pay attention to this because we're going to be comparing this to when we go to Greece later. These, um, these are these warriors, the soldiers that are attending uh, the throne hall. It's a very uh, dignified, static uh, uh, procession, one per stair. Uh, and you can picture what it would be like to have the actual soldiers uh, in front of these, uh, these virtual soldiers. Uh, and so this wall is populated by both the soldiers and the tribunes coming from other lands. And so when they come, they actually see an image of themselves, the dress, again, the sumptuary coats, that we've talked about before, 
the specific uh, symbolization, the specific signals of this is who I am. I am a Median, I am of this rank, and I am uh, coming to the court. That would have been communicated uh, in the narrative. Remember, this is about the denotation. Uh, and so buildings mean what they mean because they are literally inscribed both with verbal text and with narrative panels. And so we see this elaborate um, sculptural frieze that is one of the main themes of this lecture because we see it all over the place. Uh, the <coughs> ox carts carrying the treasures. So here's another view of the plan. Um, remember, we're coming up the stairs here to the Hall of Great Nation, uh, Gate of All Nations, and then into the main throne room. Uh, there's also a treasury that fills up with the treasures coming, flowing in from the lands that have been dominated. And this is a, a very elaborate uh, column capital uh, that combines elements of the Ionic that we'll see when we get to Greece, these volutes, uh, and this highly elaborated uh, bull motif that is the symbol of uh, Persian culture. And so here we continue with these creative uh, visualizations. There's what it looks like now. Here's what the artist tells us it looked like. These massive doors, uh, they were made in wood and covered with, uh, with forged metals. Uh, the columns would have been made out of Lebanese teak um, until it gets to a certain size, and then they're forced to go into uh, stone. Uh, and so that's why they still exist, it's because they were so large, they were forced to do it in stone. So here's another visualization um, with the massive uh, doors and the lion motif. This hall was enormous. This is the 100-column hall, and in the gateway there was a, um, in the 100-column hall, in the gateway on either side, there are uh, sculptural representations of 50 ministers on each side from different lands. And so uh, the, the 50 ministers would be welcomed in the portal, in the doorway, and see themselves in the presence of the 100 columns, which is going to resonate when we get to Greece again, uh, that the columns uh, at one point are very literally uh, represented as the human body. And so we see here the activity that happens in the throne hall, uh, the tribunes, and here's the the representation um, by the digital artists of almost the exact scene in 3D. Um, so quite interesting. And the inscriptions um, are in multiple languages. And so here's the Babylonian language version of this inscription uh, that proclaims the benevolence of uh, the Persians. Uh, but there was also an element of terror uh, that was the, the flip side of the same coin, um, this accumulation of power. Here's the portal showing the 50 uh, ministers uh, on each side of the portal heading into the 100-column hall. Here's the unfinished uh, next gate that was built by Antaxerxes, the, um, the great-grandson of uh, Darius I. Uh, never finished, but this is what it would have looked like. Uh, check out the scale. Um, in this view, it could be of any scale because there's nothing to measure by, but here's uh, an actual human figure. So these blocks of stone were absolutely massive. And this was part of the exemplification of power, is that if you can move stones of this size, you've got something going on. Um, here's we actually have the actual artifacts, and so uh, we're able to match, in this case, photo photographs of the actual artifacts and overlay them on top of the sculptural uh, bas relief. And here's the treasury, where this vast hall where all the gold and wealth uh, coming through the extension of the Silk Road. We've been talking all term about trade between East and West and how crucial that has been throughout the centuries. Well, this is where it begins. The Silk Route was connecting China and India for several centuries. Uh, and it, 
fell to the Persians to pick up the road and the route from uh, South Asia and extended all the way to the Mediterranean world. And that's what they did. And they built roads. They established this Pony Express style uh, relay stations. Yes. Um, I don't know about in this case, but I know in other cases they, uh, they do microscopic analysis of the pores of the stone. Um, and because some of that tint would penetrate deeper into the stone and thus be protected um, from erosion uh, and fire, because that's how this all ends. Good question. Uh, and so here we see this extension of the road. Um, not the best image, but you see in the gray, if you can make out the gray, that is the Persian Empire. Um, Bactria is a very interesting case of interaction between the Mediterranean world and Asia uh, as mediated by the Persians. And so this is the royal highway going from Susa to Sardis, connecting right there to the Greek city-states, uh, Sparta, and then between Susa and Persepolis, and then from Persepolis over to Bactria, uh, the Khyber Pass, uh, which continues to trouble us today. Uh, here are all the different cultures. So uh, it really is, and we've seen this before, the Persian Empire is really this cosmopolitan collection of uh, peoples uh, who are being pulled together. And their identity is left intact as a key strategy of power because there's something about humiliating people that uh, inspires them to rise up against you. Um, this looks like it belongs somewhere else. No, this is okay. This is, um, so this is the campaign, the military campaign that uh, Darius engages in uh, that where the, the Persian Empire is established, starting with Babylon and then heading eastward uh, and reaching as far as the Nile, uh, where all that influence comes from. And the Persians get deeply involved with Greece in the Greco-Persian Wars, which um, are part of what one of the first well-known historians of human history, Herodotus, is writing about. That's one of the reasons we know so much about the Persians. We're reaching back in history like we did with Hinduism, where into the dark shadows where oral traditions and the lack of written communication uh, keep us in the dark about many things. But here are some of the, uh, we know an awful lot because these historians had a habit of counting their steps. And so you knew exactly how far it was from this uh, event to that event. Um, now, after the, um, what is this? That's our sign to move on, right on time. Um, so the Google Earth zoom in, is it okay if we don't do that? We're just going just right next door over to Athens, okay? Um, so here we are, one of the great moments of architectural history. And uh, this is one of the problems. It is such a great moment of architectural history. It is such, uh, as, um, as an author who recently, you know, for decades, no one wrote about the Acropolis or the Parthenon, because what else is there to write? Historians, uh, when they sit down to write the history of architecture, step one, see if the Parthenon is covered. Step two, write about something else. The Parthenon is at the center of our, and by our I mean uh, uh, European civilization's identity of itself. It is at the center, it is the paragon. So that makes it a hot potato. Um, the, she calls it the screen upon which images of ourself are projected. And so those projections are so heavy and so loaded with importance that it makes it difficult to actually see what it is. 
we make banks out of this, we make churches out of this, uh, we make the Supreme Court, uh, and we'll see a few other examples. But it, uh, the primary thing, if we were going to look at it, if we were going to rise to the challenge, as Connolly uh, attempts in her recent book, just published a few months ago, uh, if we were to attempt uh, to look at the Parthenon the way we look at other evidence of architectural history and the other evidence, the architectural evidence of world history, we would see this as a, a temple to the worship of animal sacrifice, of establishing this heavily pagan idea of man's place in the natural order of the universe. Uh, a, a temple to the Greek god of Athena in competition with Poseidon, uh, as we'll see. And so the connection to uh, the way it's been deployed uh, in the 2,000 years plus years since, the 2,500 years since, is barely recognizable to the meanings that were embedded in the original temple. So um, that's an interesting juxtaposition. Um, the, the Greek temple, as Vincent Scully has written so well, uh, is essentially an instrument for establishing this, this place of, of human of humans in the natural order of the universe and maintaining that. So it's at its core, it's not so different from what we were talking about on Monday with the Hindu uh, uh, obligation to maintain the order of the universe. Another bizarre uh, misperception of history, uh, since the Renaissance, there was this conception of this classical architecture as being bleached, stark white. And thus, uh, when we looked at the Columbian World's Fair in Chicago, uh, making the white city uh, a, a central paradigm of civic architecture in the U.S. and around the world, uh, it was a white city because that was the misperception of Greek classical architecture. Uh, again, looking at the pores, uh, they've found that it was anything but white. It was actually quite colorful. And so the more recent visualizations of the Parthenon uh, are very different. And even this needs to be updated because of the, uh, the sculptures would have been clothed. Uh, at the center of it, there was um, the statue of the goddess Athena uh, dressed as a warrior. And this was at the center of Greek identity of who they were. Pericles was not just the driving force behind the construction of this temple and the Acropolis itself. He was also uh, a general, one of the most successful generals ever in the Greek wars. And this building was an instrument for constructing an idea of Greece more than anything else. And uh, it's that idea of Greece whether or not it matches well or less well, the reality of Greece is what lived on. Greece itself as an empire uh, actually rose and fell very quickly. It oscillated up and down for a long time um, because of the wars. We've seen this slide before, the skeuomorphism of uh, Vitruvius, his idea of how the Greek temple, the forms of the Greek temple can be explained by their uh, wooden timber precedence. Um, and I'm introducing into evidence for the first time in the course uh, the uh, illustrations of Sir Bannister Fletcher, uh, someone we love to hate because, and I don't have the slide that should appear here, which is the tree of architecture, which shows uh, Egypt, Greece, and Rome at the roots, and then right, that tree of architecture rising up to the glorious Renaissance neoclassical flourishing of architecture in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries uh, on classical roots. And then these aberrant little stubby little side shoots of Indian, Persian, these primitive vernacular architectures. And so it's that uh, Eurocentric prejudice that has us loving to hate Sir Bannister Fletcher. But let's give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, to quote Jesus. Um, he does a pretty good job <coughs> So uh, with this stuff, with the classical orders. Uh, he satisfies an awful lot of our criteria for information design, 
of uh, having it read like our analyses every week and like our term projects, it reads in one way when you step back and then it invites uh, going in deeper. And you can see the methods of uh, leaving notches in the stone drums so it can be lifted and put in place and then chiseled off once it's in place. He gives us the evidence of skeuomorphism, himself attempting a slightly different interpretation of Vitruvius's uh, description of the origins of stone form in, in, um, in wood. He gives us an excellent uh, depiction of some of the refinements of uh, the Doric order, uh, the problem of the corner. Uh, what do you do when you get to the corner? There's an optical illusion and a structural problem with the uh, triglyph and metopes, the alternating panels up here on the freeze zone, um, which we're going to look at a little bit more closely. Uh, and so uh, in the Parthenon itself, he gives us um, uh, an excellent set of views. There's the corner. Um, we're going to look more at that, uh, the corner problem. Um, and the development of the orders. Now, in the Eurocentric view, the classical orders are divinely inspired. There is something inevitable about them. Because nature is what it is, the classical order is the uh, ultimate, inevitable, logical, rational, scientific perfection of architectural form. That is... Um, at least overstated and at most a bit bizarre and uh, highly suspect uh, if you take a global perspective. Um, being that as it may, it is remarkably uh, the outcome of this iterative process of refinement and refinement again over hundreds of years. So if you were looking if you have an obsessive compulsive disorder and you're looking for a safe harbor for your mind and brain, it wouldn't be crazy to dig into this, look at the history, and then continue to replicate it in architectural production into the future, till the end of time, uh, which some people are doing. Uh, in the meantime, we have um, these new tools of computers, and we have things like this, where um, this is a, a 2012 publication that tries to do what Bannister Fletcher does with a computer. And I just have to say, I, I never say this because my father used to say this, and it was very painful when he used to say this, but you just have to say, come on, right? You gotta do at least as well as this guy did with a pencil 110 years ago, 120 years ago. That's, there's no excuse for that. And there's going to be a few of those in this. And so Sir Bannister Fletcher shows it like this in 1896. Ballantyne shows it like this. You decide. And so we get this very rich development of the Doric order, the Ionic order, the Corinthian order. Again, if we had more time uh, in a traditional history of architecture course, the ones I took and TA, uh, we'd be spending two weeks on this. But that's not us, so we're not. Um, Fletcher also gives us a very clear uh, description of entasy. Did I say it right? Entasy, the, uh, remember the column swells like a, a Twinkie under load. Uh, it swells its fattest there, and it gives us a very precise uh, demonstration of that. Um, there's also this optical illusion. Now, this is a key point in the humanism of the classical orders. It changes its form based on how humans perceive reality. Now, we've been talking about this before, but this is a really great illustration of that. And so because human perception tends to see things deflected downward, we compensate by deflecting them upward. Is it built like this? No. This is a caricature of the form of the temple. But this is one of the amazing refinements of the Parthenon 
if you sight along the stylobate base, you'll see this subtle curve. You don't see it right away, but it's there. Why is it there? It's compensating for the specific uh, physiological perception of human vision. This is uh, a very sophisticated refinement. Now the problem of the corner. Now these, if, if these are the beam ends, they have to sit structurally on top of the axial loaded columns, and they need to align. These are resting on the girder that are picking up the, end, the loads from the end of the beam. Now, if that's the case, what do you do here? What's the problem of the corner? So uh, do you extend the corner? Do you keep the rhythm the same? Or do you shrink the corner? So this doesn't quite cover it because what, um, what happens at the Parthenon is the corner is shrunk. So rather than landing in the center, this spacing is kept the same, but now it lands at the edge so that the beam itself can turn the corner. Uh, and so the spacing here is A, it's A, 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 B. And I can do that because you know about polynomial algebra, right? And so it's a very subtle thing, but it, it feels stronger at the corner. It's one of those human perception things uh, where actually the physics and the aesthetics come together. I've had a professor of structures who was also an architect, and he would say, if it looks right, it probably calculates right. And uh, I don't believe that's true. Um, I've found working with students over the years that it's absolutely not true. You can't really trust that. But what he's talking about is developing by iterating back and forth a sense of structure. What does proper structure look like? And that's really what this uh, exa exemplifies and exudes. So let's take a look quickly at the, at the narrative freezes. So back to this denotation, uh, not through text in this case, but through the depictions of human figures on this frieze. That is a, um, uh, an innovation of the, the Parthenon, where uh, on the interior porch, there's an additional freeze zone where um, these uh, play acts out. Well, I guess we're going to take a quick detour. The quarries for the Acropolis exist just outside of the city of Athens. And this is a depiction, uh, a very excellent analysis of how they can find in the quarry exactly the location of where the stone was pulled for each building of the Acropolis. Uh, and so they're able to reproduce how this is the base um, plinth uh, and drum, first drum of a column for the Parthenon, being formed uh, mostly uh, in the quarry and then uh, transported up the hill, down, down from the quarry and, and up the hill into the site. So here we see um, this freeze zone that is inside the porch, uh, protected from the weather, but not protected from bombardment uh, in the 17th century. Here's the, uh, the footprint of the old uh, Parthenon in comparison with Peric what Pericles builds, uh, and the story of uh, the gods. And it is through the telling of this story of the gods, this association with the Athenian uh, people, and the story of the Athenian uh, society in direct relationship to uh, the Greek gods that uh, is, is the, one of the key strategies that Pericles employs to establish a very clear demonstration of the moral superiority, uh, uh, the dominance, uh, the deserved dominance of Greek culture. And it works. Um, and so the stories go on throughout these friezes. They've been very carefully studied over the years. Uh, it's interesting that um, when the British were conquering the world, one of the things they did is they, they stole these marble friezes uh, of white marble to, and took it off to the British Museum. So here, we, if we want to see them uh, for most of the last few centuries, you have to go to London um, to see 
the, this, one of the highest accomplishments of Greek culture. Here's what it would have looked like. Um, some of the friezes are very much depicting the gods. Other friezes are, predicting, are depicting the Pan-Athenian uh, uh, procession that was an annual event to, um, to establish uh, this collective idea of Greece. And it was in Pericles after the construction of the Parthenon where he is rousing the troops up to go to war. He uses the Parthenon. He basically, uh, the way he convinces um, the soldiers to fight and die, and die gloriously and die gratefully, he says, hey, we're all, we're all going to die eventually. What greater privilege is there than to die for greatness? And this is not the greatness of Greece as a powerful nation. Greece is not great because it's powerful. It's almost an argument that uh, Abraham Lincoln used. He says Greece is powerful because of the power of its ideas. And historians point at this moment as uh, the unique thing about Pericles' vision for Greece is he says, don't fight for Greece the military power, fight for Greece the idea. We have democracy, not really, as long as you were a, um, a male uh, property owner um, of a certain age, then you got the right to vote. Um, but even that was radical at the time. Um, but Greece as an idea, Greece that uh, was attempting to educate people so that they could take part in uh, political discourse, and part of that was uh, the Acropolis as an experience. And so there was a carefully choreographed bodily experience moving through the space of the Acropolis. We saw this when we looked at Le Corbusier, his idea of the architectural procession, in part was inspired by his visit to the Acropolis. That architecture is a choreographed armature that uh, that suggests a certain path and the human perception along that path. And so this path of perception uses the idea of parallax, which you know from chemistry, you've got to look straight on in the graduated cylinder or else you're going to get a misreading. Uh, so you know about that. Um, and so parallax is the human perception as one moves through space. And so it involves the experience of the Acropolis as a space. It also involves the experience of uh, the friezes. Um, the friezes would have been distorted so uh, to take into consideration that they were being viewed from below. And so there's this optical distortion, not so different from what we see at St. Peter's and in the Broke of the forced perspective. Uh, and so here's the framing of the Acropolis as one rises up, famously sketched by Corbusier. Uh, we see it in exactly this view. It's, we have access to the two facades, and actually this is the back. You have to go around. This is where the treasury was located, and it forces you to move around the temple and enter from the far side. Uh, we also see the erectium uh, over to the left, which is the location of the famous Cariatid columns, still various interpretations, which we don't have time to go into. Um, the birthplace of Stoicism. These are the grounds where Socrates uh, instructed his student uh, Plato, and Plato instructed his student Aristotle. Uh, and there was a transition between Socrates and Plato, who uh, saw the origins of truthfulness in the elegance of the idea. So there's this veneration of abstraction as the source of human knowledge. If it's an elegant idea and makes sense, uh, then it's true. And we see that in the platonic solids that Corbusier was referring to uh, that came up previously in the course. Uh, but then Aristotle takes a different approach. He, his approach is that, no, the sensual world uh, is the source of knowledge. And that's more of what we're doing in this class. You're not allowed to say it unless uh, you can show us. And so this is the birthplace of Stoicism, named after the Stoa um, nearby. So let's look at the history since uh, the fall of, uh, of the Greek Empire. Um, there's a lot going on over the centuries. Uh, the Ottomans take over. Uh, they build a mosque. Um, the 
the Turk in the Turkish Ottoman uh, occupation of Athens and the fight in the wars uh, with Venice, uh, the Turks store the gunpowder and the munitions for the cannon emplacement on the Acropolis in the Parthenon itself. And after six days of bombardment by the Swedish forces allied with Venice, they finally score a direct hit. Boom. The whole thing is blown to bits. Uh, and in 1834, um, the German architect von Klinze, uh, who is the architect of the, Germ the Germanic king of Bavaria, whose son becomes the king of Greece. So this German king of Greece hires his father's architect to uh, restore the uh, Parthenon. And here's the vision. And the key thing to do is to create a barbarian free uh, Acropolis, to erase the history of Ottoman rule um, uh, from the historical record, the historical architectural record. Um, the recent, uh, part of the research, the fresh research that's reflected in, in what I'm saying comes from uh, the recent campaign to take apart the Parthenon, correct the errors of its false reconstruction, and put things back um, where they belonged originally. This is a depiction of the, uh, the, each column should be one color. And wherever there are missing elements, you identify those missing elements with a color or a piece of metal embedded in it so that we're not uh, deceiving anyone about what's original and what's uh, a replacement. Um, another come on moment here is the prior uh, restoration efforts. Uh, uh, clever by half, too clever by half. Let's put steel in there to make sure that it can stay up in an earthquake. Oops, the steel expands at a different rate uh, than the stone. And so you have thermally uh, induced destruction of the original stone of the Acropolis. Come on, you can do better than that. When they built MIT, we knew about that and didn't allow that to happen. Um, a replica in Nashville uh, in concrete. Uh, basically, this veneration of classical architecture takes on a life of its own. Uh, it comes to us uh, in the 21st century through the filtering lenses of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, uh, the battle over in the 19th century uh, of the Gothic versus the classical, uh, all kinds of layering of identity constructions of Western civilization, quote unquote, uh, get layered on top of this architectural vocabulary to the point where uh, it's almost a parody of itself. Uh, but it blossoms and culminates in the neoclassical. Um, and now we have Bernard Schumi's uh, 2009 Acropolis Museum. One of the excuses the British used for centuries, uh, or over a century, we can't give back the algae marbles uh, that we stole from the Parthenon. You can't be trusted. You, Greece, uh, you can't be trusted with them. We'll take care of them. Uh, and so Greece builds this state-of-the-art museum um, by Bernard Schumi, and the marbles, that excuse is taken away, um, and the marbles are reunited with the site in that museum. Okay. Any questions about that? I fell behind a little, um, but we're going to make up some time. Going down to Alexandria. Um, <coughs> one of the forces... Uh, operating at the end of uh, the Greece supremacy, Greek supremacy is the neighboring nation state of Macedonia, uh, where Alexander the Great uh, is born uh, to be great. He shows signs of greatness right from the start. And he becomes um, the most successful empire builder uh, uh, up to this point in history. Of course, Genghis Khan, as we mentioned, way outperforms Alexander the Great in terms of population, speed, uh, land area, connecting east and west. But uh, until Genghis Khan, it's Alexander the Great who um, is the champion. And wherever he goes, he establishes cities. He established 70 cities to cover his tracks, to create, 
to consolidate the network of transport routes between his conquered lands. And here at the mouth of the Nile River in Egypt, he establishes Alexandria. 20 of the cities he establishes are called Alexandria. One of them is named after his horse, Bucephalus. Um, and we have no idea what it looks like. We don't even know where it is. It's probably underwater. One of the things that uh, hopefully will become clear the next time I teach this course is some scuba diving archaeologist is going to find the foundations of the great library of Alexandria. Um, in the meantime, we're handicapped by these depictions. I'll point out some of the flaws. Uh, I picked this one because it's the most Greek looking. The whole point that Alexander is making here, he is a huge fan of Greece. He considers himself to be Greek uh, because Macedon was part of this loose league of Greek uh, the, the, the Greek League of, of Nations allied against Sparta and then with Sparta and then against Sparta again in uh, all these battles. Um, and so his job, he is a cultural warrior. His job is to make the world safe for Greco, the, the Greek cultural world to dominate. And he, he succeeds. He's that's why when we were looking at Constantinople and Byzantium in the Eastern Church, it's the Greek-speaking church. He sped, spreads Greek culture across eastward, across the Middle East, and deep into Asia, um, where it then takes root as far north as Russia uh, with the Greek church. So here we see um, a very Greek architecture, which is probably about right. But what's wrong with this picture? Here we see Alexander the Great depicted as a great pharaoh of Egypt. Probably not, because mentioning Egyptian culture is not what we want to do here. Here we have this, uh, this second-rate culture, the Greeks, who are fairly young, compared to the Egyptians, who uh, developed this the most remarkable uh, culture and civilization and the longest lived civilization, thousands of years, as we'll see when we get to Greece. And here comes Alexander the Great, for all his greatness, he's number two. Greece is number two. So this is the We Try Harder campaign. That's an uh, allusion to Avis Rent-A-Car that used to be the number two rent-a-car company, and they made that their big slogan. We try harder. We're number two, so we're going to do more to please you customers than number one, which was Hertz in the car, I think. But so this is the We Try Harder campaign. This library is the method and the instrument of that We Try Harder campaign. He is going to make Greece uh, better than Egypt ever was. And he does that by aggressively bringing every book in the world into one place. Um, this is the burning of uh, Persepolis. Uh, when he conquers Persepolis in 330, bringing an end to that, to the Achaemenid uh, dynasty of the Persian Empire. Um, and he, can, he, he covers a lot of ground from, here's Athens, and we, this is um, Alexander's birthplace. He, uh, at a very young age, uh, he starts his campaign, I think he's 20 years old, he conquers Egypt, and then he moves... Um, very quickly across uh, into Asia, Samarkand, uh, skips Isfahan, and then back. And he really wants to conquer all of India. He's heard all kinds of things about these uh, Indian emperors and the richness and the wealth of these uh, societies that we've studied uh, last week. Um, but his soldiers refuse. They will not let him continue. And so they turn back um, just short of crossing the river uh, into um, the great empires of northern India. And they take this arduous journey back, losing more soldiers on the return journey than in all the campaigning. And so this was his um, glorious, uh, he died when he was 30, I believe, um, 
uh, but this glorious uh, campaign to conquer the largest <coughs> empire in the world. Um, here's one artist's depiction of the harbor at Alexandria. Um, there seems to be some agreement about what the lighthouse looks like. Um, here's a depiction of what the town layout would have been uh, with the grid, the Greek grid, um, and these. This is the the um, Mausian, uh, which was the name of the complex around the library. Yes. When you say he like conquered this large region, what does that mean? Because I think he like he didn't leave people there. He was like he put his flag up. He left some people there. Um, but he was much better at destroying than he was of building. And this actually happens after his death. He, he sets up the, the territory. Uh, he sets up the soldiers. He sets up these, the 70 towns that he builds are fortified towns. And one of the things that we've seen in other topics, and I should have emphasized it in Athens, is that when you build a wall, now you can hold your territory. And it's not about holding the territory like the state of Massachusetts. No, you can hold all of Massachusetts if you build a fortress around the MIT campus. And you can hold the MIT campus. And so by building these fortified outposts that can uh, withstand long sieges um, by vast, vastly outnumbered forces, you can just hold on and persevere. And then when they're depleted, you can come out and, and take over again. And so that's what he did. He sets a few people in these fortified towns, like we saw in Batavia, the Dutch are able to hold, uh, and we saw it in Malacca, and we saw it in Cartagena. The fortifications, the architectural instrumentation of military uh, fortress architecture is very powerful. And I didn't put in the picture of one of the fortified towns, but you do not want to go up against these bad boys. Uh, you're just going to lose. And so that's how he did it. Does that make sense? Or does it raise more questions than it answers? It wasn't very normal. Um, you were cowering in the fortified town, hoping your, your water and food holds out longer than their water and food. Well, no, they would be in there. They would be farming, and they'd be selling, and life goes on. They have to just adjust to the new, like the Republicans get in office, the Democrats get in office, new kings in town. Okay, I'm just going to make my pottery and grow my wheat. It's uh, business as usual. And so here we see um, a very creative rendition of the port of Alexandria. Uh, we're coming in over the harbor. These types of ships actually do ring true, very long and narrow. Here's a depiction that actually makes sense. It's not so bad. Um, it looks very Greek, and so I'm willing to go along with it. I'm even willing to show it to you because we don't have much else to go on. Although I'm a little suspicious when hot Cleopatra shows up because this is like a Assassin's Creed or something. Uh, I don't really... Um, so none of that in here, but, well, there she is. Um, and so this interior is not bad. Uh, it's very Greek, and we go in... And we know that the library itself looks something like this because in the seraphium, uh, the basement of a temple, was an extension of the library. And just in 2004, we discovered these lecture halls. Um, and each lecture hall was associated with a different uh, body of science, of knowledge, a classification of knowledge. And there's these uh, categories of knowledge which are used to organize uh, the contents of the library, and that's the system that uh, dominates um, until uh, the Dewey Decimal System in the 19th century comes in. And so it's the Library of Alexander cataloging indexing system that is used. This is wrong because it's so Egyptian. They wouldn't have uh, accommodated so much Egyptian stuff. Now, when it comes to Persian, it's different. Alexander, uh, when he conquered Persepolis, he organized a vast wedding between his officers and captured uh, princesses to populate his empire with this assimilated population of Greek-Persian uh, inheritance. 
And he even raised a few eyebrows, more than a few eyebrows, when he started dressing like a Persian. Uh, and so Persian culture was okay to assimilate, Egyptian culture not so much. And so you see uh, some of these creative uh, representations. We get a clearer sense from other places. In Anatolia, we see this architecture from about the same time. Um, it could have very well been something like that. Um, and here's another depiction. Um, wait, who's that? Could it be? It is. It's Carl Sagan. So back in the 70s, they already had this depiction of the library. And Carl Sagan is getting in on the act because this is the uh, center of intellectual life that would have attracted the brightest minds uh, throughout uh, Eurasia and Northern Africa to come study at this library, getting a nice stipend simply to uh, study the contents of the library and advance the thinking. Um, some of the great uh, minds of the time, Euclid, Archimedes, Ptolemy, um, there was a historian who uh, wrote three volumes that were in this library that documented the history in three periods. And one of those periods was from the, the creation uh, to the Great Flood. And he covers a time span of 432,000 years, which is 10 times what uh, the biblical accounts are. And so the loss of the library in a fire um, uh, after six centuries of this was one of the great losses of, uh, of all human history. Um, the story, uh, there was uh, one astronomer, astronomer who <coughs> they find fragments of these papyrus scrolls, and they can tell what they were talking about, and they've uh, identified one scroll uh, by the astronomer <coughs> Aristarchos of Samos, who uh, realized that uh, he envisioned a heliocentric uh, uh, solar system with the Earth going around the Sun. And it would take another 2,000 years uh, for us to make up for that loss of knowledge. It would have been much faster um, had we not done that, uh, had we not lost the library. And so the scrolls were all organized uh, in these bins according to these categories. Um, and um, so here we even have a globe. Um, this very profound understanding of the world um, that is, was all lost. Um, one of the great things that um, uh, also for the, the perspective of this course is that Ashoka's uh, ambassadors, remember Ashoka? He was sending out the good news of Ahimsa, the, the, uh, the, the belief in nonviolence. He sent them out I said that they sent them out and they reached as far as the Greek-speaking world of the Mediterranean. Well, the Greek-speaking world of the Mediterranean also went to meet uh, Ashoka's emissaries, and they developed this very advanced Greek-Buddhist culture. Uh, some of the first depictions of the Buddha are inspired by a Greek sculpture of Apollo, because the uh, Greek uh, artisans are spreading to South Asia, the northern part of India, and there's this uh, resurgence in the first and second century AD with this Greco-Buddhist uh, uh, culture um, that was a remarkable example of the globalization. Alexander shows up in uh, Arabian, uh, Hindu, uh, Urdu texts, and even in the, the Quran. Uh, and here's a, uh, an upside down, from our usual perspective, map of the world that shows um, this character, Dulkarnain, who is believed to be Alexander the Great, building a wall as he did across Scotland to separate Rome from everything non-Roman. Uh, and here is Alexander the Great is depicted as separating the chaos of Gog and Magog from the orderly world to uh, hold off the chaos until the Day of Judgment and Islam can arrive. And so Alexander the Great has a role in Islamic culture. Um, so there we see some of the uh, cross-fertilization, and like I said, 
the Silk Route between the overland Silk Route between China and northern India gets extended into this system by Alexander's empire all the way and by Persepolis, he, and he extends it even further. So, getting to our last site, um, there's the Mediterranean world again. Uh, coming down into Italy, into the city of Rome, uh, we see our old friend St. Peter's Basilica, um, and just across town, uh, we go to, don't avert your eyes from all the other interesting things to look at in Rome, and just let's just focus on the Pantheon. So the Pantheon is, the uh, of the many candidates, the one I've chosen to exemplify the story of Rome and what Rome is trying to do. And what Rome is really trying to do uh, at this point, uh, the Pantheon is built very late in the, uh, at the apogee of the Roman Empire, uh, Emperor Hadrian comes to rule. Um, he's born in Spain, and so he spends a lot of time on the outer reaches of the uh, Roman Empire. And so he's a very worldly person. And he uh, identifies in the ability to build things a great capacity for uh, consolidating empire. And what the Romans do brilliantly, and perhaps one of the most brilliant uh, examples of this, is they demonstrate their authority. They demonstrate their superiority by the things they build. And it's not just Hadrian's uh, constructions and the aqueducts and the other things they build in Rome. It's the roads, and it's the towns, and it's the system. What um, the group of scholars and authors around Rem Kohlhaas have identified as the Roman operating system, which is an analogy I really like because it is like an operating system in that it is self-replicating. So the first strategy we're going to look at is he puts this very Greek uh, temple front on the front of the building, so it's familiar. He alludes to the uh, sponsor, the patron, the great patron of the first pantheon on this site, a rectangular building that's entered from the opposite side, uh, Agrippa, uh, who builds the first pantheon in 27 BCE. Um, and so he understands the need for continuity. And so he's giving people what they need. This is a continuation of what came before. And in that way, he's acting like uh, a Javanese or a Chinese or an Indian king, saying, no matter how violent the change, I'm going to offer you a narrative that says, eh, it's the same. Um, and so he gives us the narrative of the same, the familiar, the uh, well-established Greek temple front. And then behind that, it's surprise, surprise, something totally different. And so the Etruscans, who are a society that occupied the Italian peninsula, are developing over the centuries these great techniques of, of vaulting. And so we see this very distinct contrast between what we call tradiation. So tradiation, and I'm sorry, it's not on your sheet. It should be. Tradiation is the strategy of structure where you have a vertical axial loaded column with a, uh, a spanning element, a beam, that is deflecting ever so slightly and in that deflection reacting to those loads. And I'm speaking the language of physics because I'm trying to cater to my audience. Um, so tradiation is the in the DNA of the Greek temple. But the Etruscans bring in this other thing, which takes on a life of its own in the Gothic, uh, the vaulting, where, where do the axial loads of the vertical elements make that transition to uh, the spanning function? Well, in a vault, it's a very gradual transition. And hopefully, you never have to span, because uh, arches work by fooling each element of the arch that it's being axially loaded. What did one uh, block in the arch say to the next one? It says, I'm axially loaded, how about you? Oh yeah, I'm axially loaded as well. Well, that's a good thing because that's all we can handle. We can't handle the tension forces of a span. Uh, so these pure compressive uh, forms of the vault, and we see it throughout the structural strategies of uh, the Pantheon, 
starting with the barrel vault uh, hidden under the temple roof, and then moving into each of these simple arches, they are relieving the forces that are coming down from this massive 5,000 ton dome uh, made out of concrete. Really? Concrete? Yes, concrete. But well, wait a minute, Professor Carr, wasn't concrete uh, invented in the 19th century? Well, invented is a big word. Um, good question, though. They found, they discovered that by mixing the ash from Vesuvius into their mortar, that it would set with a hardness like stone. So they didn't understand the chemistry but they understood what they could do. And so the Romans had concrete, and they used it. Uh, so they took the Etruscan uh, physics strategies of vaulting, and they mixed it with the concrete strategies that this new material allowed. But, Professor Carter, what happened to that concrete? Well, we lost the recipe. We lost the technology. If only we had a library where we could keep those, that information and pass it on to subsequent generations. So they, um, they, it gets rediscovered in the 19th century, and thus all our buildings, like this one we're in, are made out of concrete. Um, and concrete formwork is a business of you build in wood the negative of the thing you want to cast in concrete. And in this case, in the Pantheon, you see brick, brick arches that are performing the purpose of relieving some of the loads on the centering mm -hmm. of carpentry so that it doesn't have to be so massive. And you see this great dome. If we had time, we'd go on a field trip. We'd go across the hall, out into Killian Court, and we'd step back and we'd see, oh my god, it's the dome. Mm -hmm. And here we go, once again, it's Ban it served Bannister Fletcher, 1896, up against Ballantyne, 2012. I'm just saying, so much better. Come on, Ballantyne. And so we have all of these elements all around us. Like the Greek architecture that stays with us, the Roman extension of the Greek architecture, moving from the the structural vocabulary of tradiation, adding to it the, uh, the technology of arches, of barrel vaults, of groin vaults, of spherical domes, and the drum. Uh, it's a remarkable elaboration of the basic vocabulary. They build aqueducts, and in so doing, they exemplify that they are masters and deserve to be masters of fill in the blank, any local society that might um, have something to offer. And so it works like an operating system. It goes viral. Uh, you send out soldiers, and you motivate those soldiers uh, through payment. They get paid by uh, taxing the local land. They establish uh, towns, and they spread, and that's how the Roman Empire uh, spreads to dominate the Mediterranean world up into the British Isles. You see this logic of the grid, which we saw in Chicago, I mean, the Jeffersonian grid across the North American landscape. The logic of the grid is that you can establish a system locally and move out until you meet some topographic feature, some geography that uh, signals it's time for the wall. And so uh, that's an operating system that we see replicated across the landscape. Our friend David McCauley gives us a very clear depiction of the elements of the Roman operating system. Every town needs to have the Cardo and Decumanus, the, the central axes of this grid-like town. Then you build the forum, the market, the baths. Uh, you feed the city with an aqueduct. You have to have a theater, an amphitheater. Um, so all of these elements are part of the formulation that we see, in a way, most vividly in North Africa, in Algeria, and the city of Timgad. Um, but Professor Coward, how come we don't see that in Rome itself? Well, Rome itself is like Paris. Remember, we saw things in the French colonies in Casablanca and Hanoi, where the French had the, the opportunity to start from scratch. 
to expand the town, to bulldoze major parts of Hanoi, and make it work the way it needs to work. Paris, not so much. Same thing with Rome. Rome is a total chaos of the Seven Hills, of the historical contingency of this neighborhood and that neighborhood, of political interests. If you want to know what the DNA of Rome is, don't look at Rome. Look at the colonies of Rome as it spreads across. Um, in Elf, when, what's the actor's name, hops from one stripe of the crosswalk to the next, he got it right. That's exactly what it was. The streets would have been filled with water and sewage, and at the crossings, this is the origin of this pedestrian stripe. You step on these stepping stones, uh, you could always hop, uh, and the carriage wheels can pass between them. And it's a very sophisticated uh, water system. Uh, the roads were built to much greater depth than anything in North America today, um, and that's why they still exist. Um, the aqueducts were very carefully engineered. If the water is going too fast, it erodes the mortar joints, and it deteriorates too quickly. If it passes too slowly, it puddles, it stagnates, the freshness of the water decays. It has to go just right. Again, it's a Goldilocks problem. So they, um, the Romans demonstrate their superiority by the geometry they impose on the landscape, and that geometry still exists across Europe in the landscape. Here's the road network. Um, sorry, that was a shuffle. Here we see the cities of Europe are filled with Roman uh, cores. So here we see the original Roman center of Florence. Uh, and there's our friend, the, the, the great Duomo Cathedral, Florence Cathedral. And we see uh, the traces of the historic progression of as Florence needs to expand, uh, it builds a new set of walls. And at the gateway, uh, the, the, the road changes direction. So you can read where the walls were by where the streets of, of current Florence, where the roads meet a, a city gate and change direction. And so you see this sequence. Uh, and so now as you travel around the world, you can now uh, look for this um, DNA. And to make our last stop, and because we're not uh, going out to Killian Court, just take one last look. Uh, you should recognize in uh, our own MIT dome an exact replica of uh, the Pantheon dome. And with an awful lot of grease thrown in down to uh, the statue. Any questions about this? Or anything? Yes, uh, what's the purpose of the coffered ceiling? The coffered ceiling uh, has two things going on that's worth uh, noting. That uh, it's making it lighter, so there's a structural reason for it, but there's also uh, an optical thing going on. Notice how, notice how the spacing is not even. The, the gaps are greater here than it is up there. Why? It's perspective. So when you look at it from below, it appears to be more even. See that trick? Thank you for asking that. What else? OK, thank you, everyone.